Yeah, when you do a period of intermittent fasting um, over several days, you can actually activate your the stem cell production in your body. You're you know, putting your body through different stresses is one of the ways that stem cells are made because your body thinks that it needs to repair itself. It thinks it needs to you know, get through this stressful time. Um, and so because of that stress, you're actually increasing your stem cell production you know, body-wide. It's not just in one area, it's, it's in your whole body. So that's one of the methods that, that a lot of uh, people who are familiar with it will use to keep their stem cell stores high um, so that they're more readily able to repair themselves you know, if they need to. Dr. Amy Killen, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yes, I am too. You're doing a lot of cool things out there. And I came on to your work because of uh, a, a mutual friend, Dr. Pampa, who's my coach and mentor. I know he's done a lot of work with you all. And I love what you're doing. It's so fascinating. I can't wait to get all into stem cells and fasting and all of the cool things you're doing. But before we do, Amy, let's talk about how you got involved with what you're doing. What is your story? So my story is I was actually an emergency medicine physician. So I was an ER doctor for about 10 years. So I was, I'm board certified in emergency medicine, went through my residency, worked at a very busy uh, emergency department in Austin and did that for um, about 10 years total. And then towards the end of that, I, I was kind of suffering myself from a lot of just you know stress and, and sleeplessness. And I had three kids in two years and I was kind of going a little bit crazy and uh, you know just not living a super healthy life. Um, and at the same time, I started seeing that all these patients that were coming into the emergency room, they had the same complaints. Like they were anxious and depressed and not sleeping and, you know, overloaded and not eating healthy and not exercising, all the things that I was doing. And so I realized that I couldn't help them until I helped myself. And so I sort of made this, this transition over a couple of different, over a couple of years uh, of learning about integrative medicine and regenerative medicine ultimately. Um, and then I eventually quit the ER and I've been doing this now for eight years or so. Yeah, that's an interesting transition from the ER to regenerative. <laughs> and so what was the biggest, you know, difficult hurdle, I would say, as you made that transition? Was there anything that got in the way? You know, you, you were back there where the, you were kind of treating something that already happened. So was right. it difficult to go from uh, effect to cause? It was definitely different. It's a whole different mindset because, you know, in the emergency department, uh, those doctors are fantastic, but you really are just dealing with what you have right in front of you. And you're dealing with the next, you know, 20, 30 minutes, an hour, and then you, and then somebody else kind of takes, takes over after that. Um, so it's very sort of acute care medicine. And so turning my mind to fo focus on, you know, five years before disease onset or 10 years before disease onset, um, or waiting for my treatments to be effective three months, six months, a year, it's a whole different, it's a whole different thing. Um, but I like it a lot because there's so many advances in this field and, and just the, the rate at which we're learning new things and, and able to implement them is so much more fun, I think. Yeah, it is a lot of fun. And, and with that being said, it's kind of like the wild, wild west. You got to really know who to trust with this information because there's a lot of information out there that is not suited for the individual. Uh, yeah. And I know and trust your information. That's why you're on the podcast. So you, you and Dr. Harry Adelson have a clinic in, in Utah. And what is the, the most common, let's say the number one uh, reason somebody goes into your clinic? So Dr. Adelson, uh, he treats only musculoskeletal pain and problems. So any joint pain, back pain, neck pain, anything that's, you know, any joint or thing that moves, he can treat that with stem cells. I focus on skin and sex, skin, hair, and sexual uh, function. And so the two of us will do cases together where we do kind of multiple different things, but it's usually one of those things, musculoskeletal problems, or then for me, skin, hair, sex. So the word stem cells, it's very interesting because I, I talk a lot about stem cells, how when you fast, you could get uh, new stem cells through autophagy and people hear stem cells and they think that you have to pay for it. It has to cost thousands of dollars. Can you break down somebody who has no idea what stem cells are, just the basics yeah. and then how you utilize it in your clinic? Absolutely. So, so everybody already has stem cells. So that's the good news. You already have them. <laughs> um, you know, stem cells are kind of, they're the master cells of your body. They're, they're present in every tissue of your body. You know, you have stem cells in your muscles, your brain, your, you know, your skin, your penis, like they're literally everywhere. And they're the cells that are responsible for the upkeep of that tissue or organ. So the stem cells can divide and make more of themselves, um, or they can send out signals to other cells around them to heal or regenerate. Um, so they're the cells that basically keep everything kind of functioning and repaired. Uh, but what happens is as we get older, our stem cells start to become less functional.
functional or and or you lose uh, some stem cells in certain parts of the body. So it takes a lot longer to heal, um, which I think we all know. Like I have a 10 year old son who has, he, he's been cutting his, like he keeps falling, he keeps injuring his knee, he slices it open like every three or four days and somehow it heals back within like three or four days. Like it's amazing versus me, I have this like, you know, cut on my knee that's been there for like three weeks and it's barely healing and that's just stem cells. Like I don't have as good a stem cells as he does. Um, but as you said, uh, we do have the ability to activate the stem cells we have through a lot of different activities um, like intermittent fasting and exercising and light therapy and a number of things like that. Or you could do like a stem cell treatment like I'm doing where we're actually moving stem cells into one part of the body to help heal that part of the body faster. So yeah, so like Wolverine had mega stem cells because he would heal just like that. <laughs> yeah, he's like an eight-year-old uh, boy only like even more so. <laughs> So, so besides taking a, a while for wounds to heal, are there any symptoms or signs of somebody who has um, not enough stem cells in their body? I mean, yeah, like everything that we associate, maybe not everything, but most things we associate with aging uh, are associated with, with lack of stem cells or lack of stem cell activity. So maybe it's your, your knee pain that you injured when you went outside and you ran and now your knee's hurting and it's not getting better. That's your stem cells are just not functioning as well as they used to. Or your skin is uh, losing you know, texture and it's starting to sag a little bit. That's your stem cells not, act, not, not making enough collagen or elastin. Um, your brain, I mean, literally everything in your body starts to break down with age and the stem cells that are supposed to be keeping those things youthful are not doing their jobs. Uh, and that's part of aging. So yeah, everything with aging. <laughs> totally. So let's go to fasting. You mentioned intermittent fasting is a way to activate stem cells. How does that work? Uh, explain how that works in the body. Yeah, when you do a period of intermittent fasting um, over several days, you can actually activate your the stem cell production in your body. You're you know putting your body through different stresses is one of the ways that stem cells are made because your body thinks that it needs to repair itself. It thinks it needs to you know get through this stressful time, um, and so because of that stress, you're actually increasing your stem cell production. You know, body wide, it's not just in one area; it's it's in your whole body. So that's one of the methods that that a lot of uh, people who are familiar with it will use to keep their stem cell stores high um, so that they're more ready more readily able to repair themselves you know if they need to so the body has these cells that become senescent right these zombie cells mm -hmm. and then when we force this uh, adaptation through a fast the body will either clean it out or if it decides that you know we can't save this cell it'll get rid of it and then it sends a signal to produce a new cell and that's the stem cell correct Exactly. And stem cells have the ability to replicate themselves. So these are special cells. Not all cells can do that. You know, some cells, can, they just, they are what they are, but stem cells can actually multiply. They can replicate themselves um, and they can also um, give rise to different types of cells. So that's what's unique about them. So yeah, so you have those, these triggers that basically tells your body, hey, you know, we need you to start replicating or ma and making more of this type of cell and you're able to do that. So if somebody wants to do some intermittent fasting to get some of these stem cells, what would you say, what would be a good schedule for them fasting wise, intermittent fasting schedule for them to get some of the stem cells? Yeah, you know, I feel like I, certainly if you can do multiple days of fasting, I know Dr. Pompa and a lot of those guys, you know, they like to do four or five day fast and, and really crank up the stem cell production um, over the, that time and get rid of all those senescent cells. Uh, but, you know, I have a lot of patients who aren't comfortable doing five day fast, but they're, but they can do one day fast or two day fast, or even just doing some time restricted feeding and, and, um, and, you know, getting sort of mini benefits, I think is better than doing nothing. And certainly for people who are new to it, I would say, you know, start slow, but if you can work your way up to several days at a time, then, then that seems to be even better. Would somebody be getting benefits if they did, let's say, an 18 hour fast on a daily basis? I don't know if you're getting the stem cell benefits, uh, certainly not as much as if you're doing a four or five day fast, but there are some other benefits that I see with, with patients, you know, regarding insulin uh, changes and, and um, a lot of the sort of changing over to fatty, you know, fatty acid metabolism, essentially being able to burn off a lot of, of calories and fat and turn on the brain and some of the sort of keto benefits uh, that you talk about when you're like on a keto diet, we can see that, you know, from just 18 hours or so, depending on the person and how adapted they are to the those changes. Yeah, I agree. So it depends on if the person's going into that fast, fat adapted or not, they could get through their glycogen stores faster if they were keto adapted. Yeah. Uh, great, great answer. So uh, are there any other ways besides fasting to activate stem cells? Are there specific ingredients and in foods that we can get it with or anything else that we can do? 
some of the big things that we talk about, exercise is going to be one, certainly it's going to be triggering some cell production. Um, red light therapy or light therapy uh, in general has been shown to, to increase stem cell production. Um, hyperbaric oxygen can do it as well. Um, even certain exercises and stress, stress relieving things like Tai Chi for some reason has been studied and been shown to increase uh, stem cell production. And there's some other, other ones I can't think of, but you know, a lot of them are just things that we know about that are healthy in general, but um, hyperbarics and uh, and exercise are some of my favorite things to recommend to patients if they haven't been doing that. What about meditation? Do you, do you, have you seen anything on that helping with stem cells? Um, I know that Tai Chi does. I haven't seen specifically if, it, if, it, if it meditation does. Obviously, it has a thousand other benefits, and so it right. makes sense that it would. Um, and I, I, it, I would not be surprised if there's quite a bit out there, and I just haven't, I just haven't seen it. Yeah, same here. So, so if somebody has been doing all that, they have the red light therapy, which I have like right here, I have mine right here in front of Yay. me. <laughs> <laughs> They've been doing intermittent fasting, they're keto adapted, they're doing hyperbaric oxygen chamber, they're doing Tai Chi, but they still <laughs> are lacking the stem cell production they want. Then they would probably go and go to your clinic. What, what would you do with that person? So it depends on what they're coming in for. The procedures that we do at my office are not so much system-wide stem cell procedures. So we're not usually doing like uh, treating, we're not, we're not treating diseases like autoimmune diseases or things like that where you need system-wide um, stem cells. We're treating specific areas where we want to increase stem cells in that area. So for instance, joints, you know, if you have a joint issue or, a, you know, a, a meniscal tear or a rotator cuff injury or something has got wrong with your joints, um, if you can put some stem cells into that specific joint, then actually it can help repair that one area. Um, and that's the same with skin, hair, sexual organs, the things that I do. So basically the way that I do procedures, there's a couple of different options, but oftentimes I'm taking stem cells from the patient. Like, so I would take your stem cells um, from, usually either from like your fat, like a, like a little mini liposuction from like love handles um, or from your bone marrow um, or both. And then I move those stem cells, I concentrate them and then I put them somewhere else in your body. So our procedures are what we call autologous which means that we're taking your cells and just putting them somewhere back in your own body. Um, that's our favorite way to do it because we know it's safe and um, it, it, you know, it's, it's very easy for the patient. There's no concerns about anything, um, infections or, or you know, any kind of problems. Um, we can also add to your stem cells things like exosomes or amniotic tissue or things like that from more youthful donors to make your stem cells work better. And we'll do that a lot of times with our procedures as well. So you, you mentioned you would, uh, if, if you were taking it from me, it would be like my love handles would be some, some sort of subcutaneous fat. Why, mm -hmm. why is that the area that you go for? That's the area that it has a it has a really good supply of stem cells, and the ones that are there are very active. And the the bruising and pain afterwards seems to be less than some other areas. We you know we've tried and studied um, you know using stem cells from your belly or your thighs or places like that, and um, either the healing takes too long afterwards uh, or is painful, or the stem cells just aren't as uh, happy and and happy to do their job. Got it. So let's, let's transition, Amy, into the, the role insulin plays in the body. You know, you talk about it uh, a few times on some podcasts I was listening, listening to, and you touched upon it earlier about getting fat adapted, getting keto adapted, bringing insulin levels down. What, what problems occur when it, in regards to um, aging faster, right? Let's, let's put it in that reference. What problems occur when we have chronically high levels of insulin? Oh, goodness, so many things. <laughs> so, I mean, high insulin is associated with high cortisol levels as well, usually, which you get, you know, you get kind of all of the stress re reactions that go with that. Um, when you have high insulin, you're oft oftentimes your blood sugar is also high because you're, you become insensitive to the high insulin over time. So your body stops responding to the insulin. You have the insulin, which is normally is the, as the, as the, uh, it's telling your body to pull the glucose, the sugar into your cells. Um, but if you have insulin that's too high for too long, your body stops listening. It's like the boy who cried wolf. It's like, well, we've heard this before. We're not going to listen to it. So all of a sudden your blood sugar is not actually getting into the cells. It's floating around outside the cells, um, which is problematic. It's why we have, you know, a type two diabetics. It's why it's one of the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and a lot of the cognitive decline that we see with age, um, high sugar levels uh, in your blood or just, you know, high peaks in sugar over time are are associated with everything from erectile dysfunction to faster skin aging because it breaks down your collagen to faster brain aging to faster joint aging um, you know artery aging like literally every part of your body is sensitive to the sugar and getting too much of that sugar um, over time is going to age you faster and, and cause more inflammation system-wide 
insulin is the bully of the block. <laughs> you know, when, when the insulin is activated, all the, all your fat burning hormones are, are scattered. You know, they yeah. just can't, they can't coexist. And, and you're right. The, the issue is with, uh, and, and it could, it could be years before it shows on the blood work, right? Because the insulin yeah. could be an issue for 10, 15 years before it's diagnosed as an issue from a conventional approach. So it's important to be proactive here, not reactive. Uh, so that's where being keto, keto friendly or low carb, high fat comes into play because you're bringing insulin levels down along with fasting. Right. What, are, what are some other tools you have? Let's talk about anti-aging tips because you are one of the pros, one of the masters in this field. <laughs> what, are, what are two or let's say three things you could, you could share on here that uh, are practical, the audience could start doing today that really help anti-age them? Mm, great question. Um, I'm a big fan of increasing nitric oxide. And that's something I talk about a lot with sexual health, but it's actually important for full body health. So nitric oxide, as you I'm sure know, is the, it's one of the main chemical messengers that tell your blood vessels to vasodilate. So to, you know, they start out small and your vessels get big. And that's how we get blood delivered all over our body. So people who have, for instance, high blood pressure tend to have less nitric oxide because they're not, they're not able to open up their blood vessels. Um, and this is you know, also important for uh, sexual function. Erections are, are started because your body increases nitric oxide production. So it's important for everything from gym performance to you know, a number of things. But what happens as we get older is uh, after about age 40 or so, we're not able to make as much nitric oxide inside our blood vessels as we used to. Um, so you know, when you're 40, you're making about half as much nitric oxide as when you were 20, and that just gets worse as you get older. Um, so this is a big problem um, for, for people over age 40 is they're not making enough nitric oxide. They don't have that vasodilation, so that affects everything from their gym performance to their sexual performance to you know, their cholesterol and blood pressure can change. Um, so that's a bit, that's a big one. And some things you could do for nitric oxide, um, exercise again, easy, uh, red what, light what therapy type, is also what good type for of that. exercise. Actually, actually all types, um, uh, in, you know, both interval training, kind of uh, high intensity interval training, as well as weight training could increase nitric oxide. Um, and then the other thing that you can do is making sure that you're eating, uh, nitrate rich foods, uh, the nitrates, the kinds I mean are the ones in like green leafy vegetables, um, you know, beets, things like that. Not so much like the, I mean, you can also eat bacon, but those, those nitrates are not the ones I'm actually aiming for. It's the ones in the leafy vegetables. Um, when you eat the nitrate rich foods, your body actually ends up making nit uh, nitric oxide from the food, as long as you're not killing the bacteria in your mouth that are responsible for part of that, which is why I say don't use Listerine or uh, antiseptic mouthwashes uh, heavily because you can kill those bacteria and you can't do that first step of the breaking down of the nitrates. And the other thing I caution against is using um, acid blocking medications, uh, stomach acid blocking medications, like Pepsid, Zantac, Prilosec, some of those things. Um, if you can avoid it, don't use those because that also affects your body's ability to make uh, nitric oxide because you actually need stomach acid to do that. So, um, so stopping the mouthwash, at least the antiseptic stuff. Um, and if you can stop the acid blockers, talk to your doctor first, obviously. Um, that'll help increase your nitric oxide and it will really benefit you system wide. That's a great tip. So what about, where does coconut pulling come into play? Because we know coconut oil is antibacterial, antimicrobial. And if somebody's doing that every single day, can that also interfere with nitric oxide? People ask me that, and I haven't seen any research on, on that. Um, I, I would expect that it's not going to be nearly as problematic as the daily antiseptic mouthwash. Um, I mean, you're, you know, and I tell patients, you can, if you want to do the mouthwash, um, you can make your own. You can use, you can use mint, you can use, um, you know, some different sort of uh, homeo, homeopathic kind of at home, do it yourself, um, baking soda, things, things like that. But, but for the most part, just don't use it every day. If you're going to use it, maybe use it before you go on a date, but don't use it like just as part of your daily routine because you actually need those bacteria in your mouth, just like you need the bacteria in your gut and on your skin and like everywhere else, uh, the microbiome in your mouth is actually really important. Totally. I agree with that. And you, I cut you off, but you had mentioned also red light therapy is a great way to get mm -hmm. nitric oxide being produced. Okay. So that's tip yep. number one. Nitric oh my oxide. gosh. That was all just one. <laughs> I feel like that was more than one tip. <laughs> that was one. We're going to get as much as we can from you here. Okay. Well, what's the second thing? My second thing is use the sun wisely. Um, and that, you know, that's kind of, the sun is kind of a double-edged sword. And it's one of those things where like when it comes to skin health, for instance, and, and aging skin, um, the sun is the biggest, the, the 
the biggest cause of skin aging. So photo aging, uh, you know, UV radiation is the biggest cause of aging of your skin. So I always tell people, protect your face, protect your skin of your hands, like places where you're going to tend to get a lot of sun. Um, you want to use protection like sunblock or hats or shade or whatever. Um, on the flip side of that, we know that people who don't get any sun exposure or who are getting very little sun exposure, uh, that's actually a risk factor uh, for, for death and aging that's similar to, to smoking cigarettes. And that's been shown in some Swedish, some Swedish studies that people who are not getting outside and getting some sun uh, fairly frequently actually you know, had an increased risk of everything from all different kinds of cancer to diabetes and heart disease, obesity, and, and just general higher mortality rates. So, um, so getting some sun I think is really important. Um, as I live here in the, in the, in the, you know, the mountains, which is oftentimes not sunny, um, but you know, use it wisely. Um, don't don't get burned, but try to get some sun. That's you know for your hormones, for all your other um, health benefits of sun. Yeah, so that's, great tip. That's number. That's a number two. Oh, number three. I'm, I usually say I don't eat sugar, but you. I feel like you already kind of talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I obviously expand that in my patients to don't eat sugar, um, or if you're going to eat sugar or simple, you know, or simple carbohydrates, make sure you're always pairing it with a good fat and a good protein to try to help blunt that insulin spike. Um, so, you know, if you have to have those things, just don't have them in isolation. Don't be, don't just get a big bowl of, you know, cereal. If you've got to have cereal for some reason, you know, make sure you're also pairing it with some other, some good fats and protein. So, so you don't have quite that metabolic effect that you would with just the, just the sugar carbo load. Yeah, that's a great tip. So you, you, you recommend if you're going to have the sugar, add some protein and fat to kind of act as that buffer. So it doesn't really spike glucose and insulin as much if you just had the sugar alone. Yeah. Now, you say sugar, but people hear that and they think, oh, okay, she's, Amy's saying sugar, but I could have like my wheat bread and my grains. <laughs> what about that? Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to think about, and this is what I tell my everyone from my kids to my patients, um, you know, your body thinks, there's a lot of different things that things are, you know, a big bowl of rice, your body thinks is sugar. Um, the same thing with a big bowl of cereal, the same thing with, you know, any of the simple carbohydrates, even the complex carbohydrates, it, it's, it takes less time to break down, so you don't get quite as much of an insulin spike, but you do still, you know, you still get that pretty decent insulin spike um, with, you know, your complex um, carbohydrates and, you know, wheat bread that's got some sprouts in it or whatever like that's still getting broken down into sugar even fruit you know it's fructose it's getting broken down into the sugar so you know you don't have to give up all of those things but i do think it's important to think about when you're eating those things i'm eating you know a handful of sugar and what else, what, what else should i do to make this not quite so bad for me yeah great great stuff and you can also add exercise to that right to kind of burn some yeah. of that sugar off yeah which, absolutely which you mentioned is already beneficial for nitric oxide production Okay, I have a personal question. So let's talk about skin health some more. I, I, um, I was exposed to mold for almost four years. I got out of exposure, moved out. But I developed what you may call like mold eyes, where you have like these hollow, I don't know if you can see mm, it here, but mm -hmm. uh, I've been working on getting rid of it. Like what are some things I can do? Because it looks like dark circles underneath my eyes, although my sleep is very optimal. I prioritize it. Yeah. But I want to work on this. So what are some things I can do to work on that? <laughs> uh, that's actually a really good question. I actually have the same problem, not from, not from mold, but just like forever, you know, genetic, yeah. uh, genetic issue with, with a dark, like dark circles under my right. eye forever. Um, you know, certainly avoiding any kind of allergens in your, in your diet, in your, in your life, toxins in your, in your environment that are, you're sensitive to. For me, it was skincare products. I didn't realize it, but for years I was putting um, like creams on my face at night and I'd wake up with these like really dark circles under my eyes um, that eventually got so bad that my whole eyes were swollen up and I actually you know eventually went to the doctor and I stopped all those all of those topicals and that actually helped my dark eyes a lot it wasn't it wasn't necessarily an allergic reaction but it was you know it was a sensitivity that was severe enough that it was causing that that um, so I always tell people you know obviously you're I'm sure your diet is very good but look at your diet making sure you're getting rid of anything that could potentially um, be a sensitivity or an allergen or get some food allergy testing um, to check on that. Sleep is an important one. Um, any, kind of, any kind of chronic diseases can also cause 
eye problems as well. But after you've kind of gone through the health reasons and you still have them, there are some other sort of cosmetic things that you can do, like uh, like doing, actually I'm a little bruised right now, but doing like PRP injections, which is just getting your blood, spinning it, getting the platelets from your PRP and injecting into those areas um, can actually make a big difference in, in the, um, the dark circles because dark circles are really, a lot of them are just due to the skin being so thin under your eyes and you can kind of see those capillaries underneath there. So we can thicken the skin a little bit, then you don't see the capillaries as much and it becomes like sort of more soft things. So PRP injections around the eyes can be really helpful. Um, there are some different kinds of uh, lasers that can be helpful around the eyes as well. Um, there are, um, you know, some good creams that have, um, that are helped kind of build up the, co the, car the collagen around your eyes can be helpful. But, but honestly, it's a pretty, it's one of the more difficult things to treat, I think. <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've been learning that myself. So yeah, those are some great tips. So were, were the skin uh, care products that you were using, were those natural or were those not natural? So they were not natural. And the ones I was using had pretty high uh, retinoids in them, which I still use retinoids. And I, I, there's a lot of controversy. You know, retinoids are vitamin A derivatives, but they're not necessarily natural. Um, but they, I still use them, but I just have, I switched to a brand that didn't have any of the other, you know, parabens or other sort of chemicals that are irritating some of the different alcohols. Um, and I use the retinoid, the, the, I use that product sparingly and I just don't put it around my eyes. And I've seen a big difference for me. Awesome. Okay, let's let's uh, transition into sexual health, which you're also uh, a pro at. You talk a lot about sexual health, and you do a lot of things at your clinic. What are some of the things that you do? I know you have uh, what's called the P shot. Is that what it's called? Yes, for men. So I do. I use. I do injections uh, for both men and women using you know either stem cells from the patient or PRP, which is again just blood platelets from blood, um, or like uh, things like exosomes or amniotic tissue, which is going to come from umbilical cords and placental tissue from someone else, um, or a combination of those things. So these sort of regenerative uh, therapies. Um, so I do the P shot, which is uh, going to be injected into the penis for men. I do the O shot for women, um, which is going to be injected into the clitoris and the anterior vaginal wall. And uh, we're basically trying to inject these in there to increase blood flow and blood vessel formation, protect, you know, possibly repair um, nerves and increase sensitivity, sensation, pleasure, things like that. How does that distinguish between, um, uh, against like the uh, Gaines wave treatment? What's the difference between those two? Um, they're different, but I use them together. So for all, in all my P-Shot patients, I also will do Gaines Wave. I'm a big fan of Gaines Wave, uh, which is shockwave therapy, or it's, you know, it's uh, essentially high intensity sound waves that we're delivering to the tissue. We could do that also for men and women. Uh, Gaines Wave is traditionally for men, but we can do it for women as well. Um, but essentially, it's, it's a similar idea. You're, with Gaines Wave, you're, you're causing a little micro trauma that's triggering this cascade uh, of healing that's recruiting stem cells and increasing local nitric oxide and also increasing blood vessel formation over time. And actually the, in the regenerative therapies that we're doing, they work in a similar way, but they've been shown if you do them together in studies, we've seen that the two of them actually work um, synergistically. So you have, you know, it's like a one plus one equals five situation. So they, they work better together than they do either one individually. Fascinating. So yeah, it's, it's kind of like um, when you work out, you got to tear down some of your muscles and they grow back stronger. That's you, you, a similar effect and you're assisting that, res that restorative effect of after you work out. So I yep. love that. That's very, very interesting. Where, where can um, my listeners and viewers learn more about your clinic and the information you just shared about that? So I have a couple of different clinics. Um, I have the uh, Doceri Medical, which is up in Park City. And that's where I do most of the regenerative stem cell procedures. And that's D-O-C-E-R-E medical.com. Uh, an easier way to reach me, if you can't remember that, is just dramykillen.com. I have a website where I can kind of read, I can kind of direct you to one of my clinics. Um, I'm also very active on Instagram at Dr. Amy B. Killen um, and like to post a lot of things that I've either learned or am doing or whatever. Yes, we'll put all that in the notes of this podcast. We have Rachel who puts it all together, but we're not done yet. I still have a few more questions for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, what's the most exciting thing that you're working on right now? Um, oh, that's, that's a good question. I have a new project that I'm working on um, where I'm working to help kind of quantify or better quantify a lot of the things that a lot of us are doing in the sort of longevity biohacking space uh, as far as 
getting objective um, evidence of, of whether these things are helping or not. So getting, helping people to facilitate testing, you know, before, during, after um, various protocols so that they are not just kind of going blindly into, you know, trying all these things and wasting a lot of money on things that may not work. So uh, it's, a, it's a project that we're just starting, but it's going to eventually, you know, evolve into hopefully something big enough that it, a lot of people can use it to help them make better choices when it comes to some of these uh, treatments and protocols that they're doing. Very cool. Yeah, I can't wait to hear more about that. What is your definition of perfect health? Ooh, um, I don't think anyone has perfect health, but I do think, uh, you know, to strive for it is obviously what we're all doing. Uh, I think living where you're not thinking about, you're not having to think about whether your body is functioning well, you're not thinking about pain, you're not thinking about, you know, whether or not you're going to be able to hike this mountain or, you know, perform in the bedroom or whatever it is, like you're not having to worry about whether your body's going to be able to do it. Um, I think that the perfect health also has to include your mind and the mental health component, um, if you're going to talk about it, because obviously that's a huge part of health, but basically just not having to worry about doing all the things that you want to do, just being able to do them um, be with people you want to be, you know, do the connections. Um, and to me, that's, that's pretty perfect. Yeah. Yes, it is. Out of all the tools out there, right? We have so many tools in our health shed. We have fasting, we have keto, we have PRP, we have stem cells, which is your favorite and why? Oh, um, that is really difficult. I think for me, it's been doing, uh, like power yoga, like hot yoga, just like yoga in general, but if I have to drill it down, um, hot sort of intense yoga has been really uh, life changing for me in the last few years. Like just you know, just from a from a physical standpoint, you're getting rid of all this stuff, uh, but then you have the mental component of it, and it's it's just something that I think I walk away from every time feeling you know, amazing. And I can kind of take on the rest of my day. And I think that um, people who I know who have adopted that practice have similar uh, ideas about it. Very cool. How often do you do it? You know, it used to be more often. Unfortunately, I've gotten really <laughs> busy. As I say that, I'm like, when did I last go to yoga? Um, <laughs> I, I try to do it three or four days a week, but a lot of times it's less than that. You know, I travel quite a bit with work and speaking and things, but, but I try to do it whenever I can. I feel like there's something to that sort of being in a dark room with other people and just sweating that is pretty amazing. Yeah. So I have my uh, rapid fire questions. You ready to do this? Okay. Okay. First question, Amy, is what is your favorite keto food? Uh, like almond butter, I think. Yeah, that almond butter is delicious. Yes, it is. <laughs> Favorite non-keto food? Ooh, pizza. Mm, yes. What, what do you, just with cheese or any, any kind of toppings? Like pepperoni, pepperoni cheese, that's it. Got it. What is the first thing that you think of in the morning? Um, coffee. <laughs> how, do you, how do you make your coffee? Just black or do you add anything? Uh, black and usually with some whole milk or like a half and half. What is the best piece of advice you've ever heard? Ooh, um, it's better to be brave than perfect. Mm, that's good. What's the worst piece of advice you've ever heard? <laughs> you should be, you should be better and try to be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> what about, what, what is your favorite TV show growing up? Um, Blossom. Ah, that I used to watch Blossom. That was a yeah. long time ago. I remember that. <laughs> People who were alive way back in the day. <laughs> I'm 35 and I remember that. <laughs> what is, um, if you had one superpower, what would you choose for that superpower to be? Ooh. Um, I would choose to help, to have, to, for, to be able to make people sort of appreciate themselves and feel good about themselves. Um, I feel like in this world, there's, there's not enough of that. Yeah, you're right. Totally right. I love that. What, a, what is your favorite hobby right now? Um, oh, my favorite hobby. I, I like to ski a lot. Is that yeah. a hobby? Yeah, that, that counts. <laughs> Exercise and hobby. Yeah. Okay, totally. perfect. <laughs> Who do you admire the most? Hmm, my 99-year-old grandmother. Amazing. That's beautiful. What a blessing. What, what's the strangest thing you've ever eaten? Um, like 
duck hearts or something like it was a duck heart soup I think I had that I didn't really realize what, what it was I'm sure there are other things but I'm not a super adventurous eater so that might have been the one how was it <laughs> It was okay. I think it was a mental thing. Once I realized what it was, I was like, ooh. But yeah, it tasted fine. I like chicken hearts. Me, my girlfriend's from Brazil. Whenever we go to like a Brazilian steakhouse, we're like taking all their chicken hearts. They're just coming around with it and we, we like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the rapid fire question's done. I have my final question for you. Let's say you were given this magic wand and with this wand, you could just wave it over the whole world and you could uh, implement something that could help this devastating trend we see we see people getting cancer people obesity diabetes it's it's in a bad direction or it's been going down the wrong direction but you could use this wand and every single person follows this rule what would you choose for that to be in order for it to shift into a better direction for health oh wow um there's so many things but i think i think if we were all able to and this is not going to be something that everyone can do but if we could all prepare and eat prepare our own food and eat it um some you know local kind of or at least personally prepared food um i think that would make a huge difference in the way that all of our health trends are going yeah absolutely okay so this has been a lot of fun i want to acknowledge you for uh coming on the podcast and sharing with us uh what you've learned over the years i want to acknowledge you because you were in the emergency room you were looking at more of the effect and you started to work on yourself, you healed yourself first, and then you started teaching other people and you transitioned now, and now you're in a field where you're doing a lot of great work. You're helping people produce more stem cells, having more confidence with themselves and, and doing so many great things out there. And I can't wait to learn more about you and maybe visit your clinic when I'm in uh, Utah. So yeah. I wanted to say thank you, Amy. I really appreciate your work and we'll make sure we put all of your resources and your links in the notes. Is there any final words you wanna share with the audience? No, thank you so much for having me and for being so prepared. Um, it's awesome talking to people who are well-read and excited. And, um, and I really, I, I love talking to you.